Number 10, Uluru Rock. I'll be honest, I'm a rock guy. I go on vacation, I'm goggles up the entire time. I love looking for geology and history. It's hard not to want to bring something home every trip, right? But depending where you are, you could be in a lot of trouble for doing so. In the Northern Territory of Australia, for example, there is a beautiful monumental sandstone formation. It's known as Ayers Rock or Uluru Rock. Now this site is sacred for the Aboriginal people of the land. They respectfully ask that no visitors take any piece of the sandstone home with them. Yet of course, some of us can't follow simple instructions and in numerous cases, bad luck has followed them home as well. Breakups, death of a loved one, you name it, it's all bad. Why risk it? Just leave things alone, you know? Number nine. Robert the Evil Doll. A man named Rob Otto, he was given a doll that looked a lot like him. One of his servants who didn't like him made him this doll. This was clearly a voodoo doll, right? Obviously, this is an obvious trap. Neighbors would then hear Robert talking to this doll. Robert and Robert the podcast, I guess. I don't know, tune in. Now, after Robert's untimely death, the new owners of the house found that same doll. They found it in the attic, still there. That family was haunted afterwards by the same doll. They would hear threats coming from it at night, so now now the doll is on display at a museum in Key West. No more threats, just glass cage forever. Number eight. Elmo. The Sesame Street icon has been in homes for many, many years. There was a literal stampede when Tickle Me Elmo was released. An employee was sadly trampled, got his ribs broken, it was horrible. People go crazy for these things. When the Elmo Knows Your Name toy was launched by Fisher Price back in 2005, there were 15,000 names ready to go. Only one family was traumatized. Only one. That's not bad, all things considered. That Elmo toy apparently spoke on its own, threatening to harm the family often, so they tossed it out immediately. This happened more than once though. The audio sounded off for some devices and some homes. Be like Elmo sounded like beat up Elmo. The Elmo phone was also released in 2009 and it often said 456, but in some cases it sounded like who wants to have very different things, those two. Those are two different phrases. Those are not the same at all. We're all learning things with Elmo, whether you like it or not. Number seven. Belcourt Castle Chairs. This one's like the opposite of musical chairs. These chairs are no fun at all. This Rhode Island ballroom is beautiful. It's a cottage mansion, a lot of wood, a lot of history. It smells great, I bet. I would have bet that there would be a ghost woman in the ballroom. Turns out it's actually a handful of chairs. Who knew? That was my second guess, handful of chairs. That's good. Visitors have reported an eerie feeling when standing close to these chairs. They get the chills, they get the sense of energy almost. Now, things certainly go a step further. Some guests have seen the chair move on their own, or they've had the chairs push against them, all of course by some invisible force. I'm not sure if I believe in ghosts personally, but if I saw a chair moving, yeah, that would do it. Just one of those would definitely flip my beliefs for sure. Haunted furniture, that, that gets me, that's pretty, that's pretty bad. Number six, the haunted skull. I'm pretty sure every skull is haunted, no? But I don't know. This one specifically, ooh, this one's real haunted though, here we go. Located in the Burton Agnes Hall over in England, the screaming skull sits quite still, but its curse is very real and very active. The screaming skull once belonged to Catherine Ann Griffith, who died in 1620. Now, reports of strange figures or shadows around the skull, that's one thing, but many people believe they can still hear the screams of one Catherine Ann Griffith to this day. Number five, the unlucky mummy. Right off the bat, the unlucky mummy isn't an actual mummy per se. It's rather the lid of a coffin that once belonged to a high status woman who lived sometime around 950 BCE. So a little old, a little, little time ago. The mummy board wasn't seen again until the early 1800s AD. It was found in Thebes. Four Englishmen found it and of course they were celebrating this ancient piece of history, but it didn't take long for all four of those men to pass away from mysterious circumstances. If you're looking for more top tens on ancient history, come meet me over on our top 10 history channel. It's called Bumblebee. We do top 10s only on historical stuff. Ancient eras, mummies, silly Victorian era hats, cool shoes, I don't know, you name it. It's all over at Bumblebee. See you there. Number four. Mandy the Haunted Doll. Mandy lives in the Quesnel Museum in Canada. Awesome, nice and close to home. The staff of the museum insists that Mandy is kept in a separate display case all by herself because when she's with other dolls, she would end up knocking them over somehow, some way. Staff also reported that their lunches would disappear and that photos of the doll would end up glitching out. The lunches disappearing, that's for sure one dude who's blaming ghosts. That's actually not a bad plan. I kinda, I'm okay with that. But the photos, that's terrifying. That's a surefire sign that it's haunted. Number three. 
the great bed of wear. We figured we'd get nice and cozy for this next one. For starters, it's massive and it's cozy. It looks like the bed a king would certainly sleep in, and rightfully so. The great bed of wear was built for the royal family back in 1463. It was 12 feet by 12 feet. Jonas Fosbrook, a carpenter from that time, they impressed King Edward IV so much with their work that the king gave them a pension for the rest of their life. People would travel all across the land to see this bed. That's a fun family vacation. Yeah, we're gonna go see a bed. Yeah, Disneyland's closed today. Let's go see this bed. Shakespeare mentioned this bed in his play, The Twelfth Night, okay? This is a big deal. All those who stayed in the bed, though, they did not have a good night's rest. No, instead they woke up to scratches and bruises, or they would wake up just on the floor. Yeah, somehow they would roll out of a 12-foot bed. Today it can be found in the Victoria and Albert Museum, in case you wanna go in there and take a nap. Would you stay the night in this old, haunted, dirty, and probably very uncomfortable bed? Sound off below, I definitely wouldn't. Number two the Baker's Wedding Dress. Back in 1849 in the small town of Altoona, Pennsylvania, Elias Baker and his wife, Hetty, lived in the Baker Mansion. They had two sons and one daughter named Anna Baker. Anna had fallen in love with one of her father's employees. Nice. Another steel worker, but her father wouldn't allow the relationship to take off. So Anna vowed to never marry again ever. She locked herself in her room for the time being. And when her father passed away in 1848, she went to find her true love again, but he had since moved on and settled down. Yeah, worst case Scenario. So she spent the rest of her days behaving erratically and her soul apparently still haunts that same wedding dress today. Not just the dress, also the mansion is apparently haunted as well. Guests would report furniture moving around. What's with ghosts and moving furniture? Where were these guys when I was moving? And finally, number one, the Bassano vase. This vase comes from the 15th century. It made for an excellent wedding gift, of course, in Italy one day, but the night before, the big day, bride sadly lost her life with the vase still in her possession. So the family kept it afterwards, of course, but as the vase was passed down the family line, a pattern began to unveil itself. It was kind of hard to ignore. Whomever held possession of the Bazzano vase died shortly after in some way, shape, or form. Now keep in mind, this was the 15th century, so the average lifespan was 30 to 40 years old on a good day. But after many deaths in the family, it was packed away for good, just to be safe, or so they thought. The vase showed up again in 1988 alongside a note. The note was pretty to the point. It said, beware this vase brings death. End of note. Pretty simple, I like it. Whoever found it was probably like, huh, okay, and then continued on with it. And then it was auctioned for over $2,000 sans note. Weird, they left the note out of that, that's odd. The pharmacist who won the auction, well, you guessed it, passed away within months. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the crystal skulls. The ancient crystal skulls found in Mexico and Central America are a group of pre-Columbian artifacts that are believed to be over a thousand years old. These skulls are made out of clear or milky quartz and are intricately carved to resemble human skulls. Despite being discovered in the 19th and 20th centuries, their true origin and purpose remains a mystery. According to legend, the crystal skulls were created by the Maya or the Aztecs and are said to possess magical powers that can heal or grant spiritual enlightenment to those who come in contact with them. Some people believe that the crystal skulls are extraterrestrial in origin and that they hold the key to unlocking the secrets of the universe. Many theories have been put forth over the years about the purpose and significance of the crystal skulls. Some researchers believe that they were used for religious or ceremonial purposes, while others speculate that they may have been used for divination, or even as tools for communication with otherworldly beings. Despite decades of research and study, the true origins and purpose of the crystal skulls remain shrouded in mystery. In our number 9 spot today, we have Linear A. Linear A is an undeciphered script used by the Minoan civilization between 1800 and 1450 BCE. The script was first discovered in 19 by British archaeologist Arthur Evans and was used to write the Minoan language, which is also still largely unknown. Linear A is composed of over a hundred different signs, including pictograms and ideograms, but it is believed to be a syllabic script, meaning that each sign represents a syllable or sound. Despite numerous attempts by researchers to decipher the script, its meaning and purpose remains a mystery. The mystery surrounding Linear A is compounded by the fact that the Minoan civilization itself is shrouded in mystery, with little known about its social structure, economy, or religious practices. The decipherment of Linear A could potentially shed light on these enigmatic aspects of Minoan culture, but for now, the script remains one of the greatest unsolved mysteries of the ancient world. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Tartaria Tablets. These are a set of three clay tablets discovered in 1961 in Romania, dating back to the Neolithic era, around 5300 BCE. The tablets contain a series of 
symbols that are thought to be the oldest form of writing in Europe. While there is still much debate about the meaning of the symbols and whether they constitute as a true writing system, many researchers believe that they represent a form of proto writing or proto cuneiform. The tablets have caused controversy in the archaeological community, with some experts questioning their authenticity and others arguing that they represent a significant discovery that could change our understanding of early human communication. Despite their importance, the Tartaria tablets remain largely shrouded in mystery, and their true meaning and purpose may never be fully understood. In our number 7 spot today, we have the stone spheres from Costa Rica. These ancient stone balls found in Costa Rica are a collection of nearly perfect spherical stones, ranging in size from a few centimeters to over 2 meters in diameter. These stone balls were created by the Dequis culture between 700 and 1530 CE, and they were discovered in southern Costa Rica in the 1930s. They have since become an archaeological mystery with many unanswered questions about their origins, purpose, or how they were made. One of the biggest mysteries surrounding the stone balls is how they were created. The spheres are made of granite and other hard stones, and they were perfectly shaped without the use of any modern tools or technology. Some have suggested that they were made using some sort of unknown technique, or that they were created with the help of extraterrestrial technology. Another mystery surrounding the stone balls is their purpose. Some believe that they were used as part of a game, while others argue that they had a more practical use, such as astronomical observations or as a status symbol. However, no definitive answers have ever been found. The stone balls have also raised questions about the Dequise culture itself. Despite their impressive creations, very little is known about the people and their language and written records, which have not survived. This lack of knowledge has made it difficult to fully understand the significance of the stone balls and their role in the culture. In our number 6 spot today, we have the Piri Reis map. The Piri Reis map is a world map created by Ottoman admiral and cartographer Piri Reis in 1513. The map is notable for its accurate representation of South America and Antarctica, which were not officially discovered until centuries later. Of course, this means that what has puzzled researchers is the source of his knowledge. One theory is that Piri may have had access to ancient maps that are no longer in existence, such as the Library of Alexandria, which was destroyed in a fire in the 1st century BCE. Others speculate that he may have had contact with extraterrestrial beings who provided him with advanced knowledge of geography and cartography. What makes the Piri Reis map even more mysterious is the presence of features that are not visible in modern maps. For example, the map includes a land bridge between South America and Antarctica, which has been confirmed by modern satellite imagery. However, this land bridge was only discovered by modern science in the 20th century. Another mystery surrounding the Piri Reis map is the presence of a series of markings and symbols that appear to depict astronomical and astrological data. Some researchers believe that these symbols may have been used for navigation or even to track the movement of the stars. Despite decades of research and study, the true source of Piri Reis's knowledge and the purpose of the markings on the map remain a mystery, making it one of the most enigmatic ancient artifacts to this day. In our number 5 spot today, we have the Antikythera Mechanism. The Antikythera Mechanism is an ancient Greek artifact discovered in 1901 by a group of sponge divers off of the coast of the island of Antikythera. The device, which is believed to date back to the 2nd or 1st century BCE, is a very complex mechanism made up of gears and cogs, and it is thought to have been used to predict astronomical events and the cycles of the solar and lunar calendars. What makes this mechanism so mysterious is its advanced technology and the fact that nothing else like it has been discovered from the same time period. The device is believed to have been incredibly sophisticated for its time, and its level of complexity was not achieved again until the development of similar technology during the Renaissance over a thousand years later. The mechanism is also mysterious because its purpose and origin are still not fully understood. Despite extensive research and analysis, there is still much that remains unknown about the device, including who built it and how it was used. The Antikythera mechanism remains a fascinating artifact, and it continues to capture the imagination of scientists, historians, and just the general public. In our number 4 spot today, we have the Voynich Manuscript. 
The Voynich Manuscript is a very mysterious book that dates back to the 15th century, written in an unknown script and illustrated with strange drawings of plants, animals, and astrological symbols. The manuscript is named after Wilfred Voynich, a rare book dealer who acquired the book in 1912. What makes the Voynich Manuscript so mysterious is the fact that no one has been able to decipher its contents or identify the language it is written in. The strange drawings and symbols have baffled scholars for centuries, and many theories have been proposed as to its purpose and origin. Some believe that the manuscript is a secret code or cipher, while others speculate that it is a lost alchemaic text or an early form of cryptography. Despite extensive efforts to decipher the manuscript, its secrets remain unsolved and it continues to be a source of fascination and speculation for scholars and enthusiasts alike. The Voynich manuscript is a testament to the enduring power of mystery and intrigue, and it serves as a reminder of the vastness and complexity of human knowledge and understanding. Maybe this book that we have is holding on to some of the most important secrets that have just been lost to time. In our number 3 spot today we have the works of old men. The works of old men are structures that were first observed from the air by a British pilot in 1927 and they are located near the Azraq oasis in Jordan. There are hundreds of these wheel like structures that are over 80 feet wide, some even as large as 200 feet. These huge structures have been dated back so far that they might just be the oldest man made creations that we have ever found. While this is all amazing, we have absolutely no idea what the they are or why they were created. The theories range from things like sun tracking to ceremonies to some sort of spiritual relevance, but we really just aren't sure. Well, things like this are incredible finds, and it's amazing that some of the first man made things still exist on our earth. It is insane how we have no idea what they are or how to use them, and unfortunately, especially because of the fact that it's been thousands and thousands of years, it's most likely that the mysteries surrounding them are totally lost with the past. In our number two spot today, Today we have the Joppa stones. These stones were found by archaeologists in China. There were hundreds of discs made of stone that were found under a ton of dust inside of a cave. The notable thing about these discs is that they resemble phonography records with a hole in the center that leads into a spiral groove. These stones are at least 10,000 years old and the groove in them is made up of super small hieroglyphics. Here's the kicker though, these hieroglyphics were deciphered and found to have stories of spaceships crashing into mountains. These spaceships were apparently being flown by what was called Drapa. After this discovery, the researcher who found it was ridiculed as people believed it was ridiculous, but years later some Russian researchers asked for a few of the stones to examine. Upon the Russian examination, they found some sort of extraordinary vibration or hum coming from the stones. After this, research on the stones either stopped or has just been hidden from the public. Finally, in our number one spot today we have the Indus Valley Script. This is an ancient writing system that was used by the Indus Valley Civilization, one of the earliest known civilizations in the world. The script is believed to have been in use from sometime around 2600 to 1900 BCE, and it is one of the few ancient scripts that has yet to be deciphered. The Indus Valley script consists of over 400 different symbols, which have been found on seals, pottery, and other artifacts from the civilization. Despite numerous attempts to decipher the script, researchers have been unable to identify the language or meaning behind the symbols. The mysterious nature of the Indus Valley script has led to much speculation about the civilization that created it. Some researchers believe that the symbols may have been used for religious or ritual purposes, while others suggest that they may have been used for trade or administration. Regardless of their purpose, the symbols remain a fascinating mystery of the ancient world, and their true meaning may never be fully understood. At number 10, we have a pit full of arms. I don't think anything nice was ever found at the bottom of a pit. No one has gone to the base of a pit and found a PlayStation 5 with The Last of Us 3. It's almost always death and this pit was no different. Some archaeologists in France came across a super deep pit. Like if you fell in it you would die 100% of the time. There's no way you're sticking that landing. Not at all. So it makes sense at the bottom of this pit they found a bunch of skeletons from people who had been thrown into the pit. It was a death pit which is the name of the metal band I'm going to start after this video. Now the thing that was so shocking about the bodies that were thrown into this pit of despair is what happened to the bodies before before they were thrown into the pit. All the people had their arms chopped off and their skulls bashed in. Like you're already going to throw the people to their death. Why would you mutilate their bodies?
bodies before you checked them in. The pit was literally layered. At the bottom layer was all arms and the top layer was all bodies that had their heads smashed in. Like some sort of sick cake. Who would do such a thing? Well the bodies were dated back to 4000 BC so their motivations were very unknown but it's probably just because they were cavemen. At number 9 we have the black sarcophagus. This is my problem with archaeologists. They're always digging around finding things that maybe don't want to be found. Maybe something was buried 20 feet underground because it was never supposed to be opened ever again. Like the black sarcophagus. This thing was dug up in 2018 and right away people were saying that this thing was cursed. It got posted all over the internet and it spread around like a mid tier meme. Like you know the kind of meme that lasts for like 2 or 3 weeks at best. Like when you look at it you just blow air out of your nose and then move on. Like that kind of meme. It wasn't great. Well everyone said that this thing was going to rain fire from the sky if it was ever opened. I mean and it does look like something pulled right out of a movie. And guess what the archaeologists did anyways? They opened it. Oh this creepy box that might kill everyone. Let's just open it just in case. There might be a boat in there. Who knows? Now nothing can be connected directly to the sarcophagus. But remember how much people were complaining about 2019 and saying a bunch of bad stuff happened? Coincidence? I think not. At number 8 we have head on your chest. How do you want to die? This might be something you want to pick because it's the only thing in life that you can guarantee. I want to die on TV saying something cool so my death quote gets turned into a meme like a hundred times. It's like all over the internet. I want my death to be turned into like an infinity war level meme. Like a huge level meme. Also side note Thanos did nothing wrong. But I don't think that these guys got to pick their death. There were some weird bodies that were discovered in England. They were dated back to the 14th century. The weird thing about these bodies is that they were all buried laying flat with their heads propped up on their chest like they were holding a basketball. Which means that someone was chopping off these dudes heads before before they sent them into the ground. Not the most fun way to die, but at least they got to keep their head. They didn't start kicking it around like a soccer ball or something. If I was one of the guys in charge, I would bury them, but I would switch their heads around so the person finding them would have to do a match game to match up the right heads. At number seven, we have puzzle time. Did you know that if you throw a person's body into a bog and it's cold enough, it will help preserve the body? Well, I didn't know this either until I started making this list. Well, there was a dude in Scotland who found some bodies that had been buried for hundreds of years, but it seemed like before they were buried, someone had been doing some bog therapy on them to keep them in a preserved state. This is slightly creepy, but let's kick it up a notch. There were two bodies found, a man and a woman. Both of their bodies were very strange. There were limbs and body parts that seemed to be too large for their frame, almost like it was some some sort of mutation. Everyone was confused. Well thanks to the magic of DNA the people digging up these bodies were able to find out that this happened because someone had been taking different body parts from several dead bodies and assembling them to make some sort of creation. Very creepy. And some of the mismatched body parts were hundreds of years older than the others. How did someone find bodies that were hundreds of years old and why did they try to attach them to other people's bodies? That's something we will never know. At number 6 we have the cheese. Usually people digging around in Egypt want to find a gold tomb that is filled with guys wrapped in toilet paper. But every now and again you find something a little more strange. A tomb in Egypt had a little snack inside waiting to be dug up. Why would this be on a list of scary things? Well because the cheese was over 3000 years old and it was packed with some unknown bacteria. If someone was dumb enough to bite into this cheese they could unleash a plague that could wipe out humanity as we know it. Death would sweep through the world and ravage every last man, woman and child. There would be nowhere on earth that you would be able to be safe from the terrors of this bloody cheese. People would become cheese monsters like all the creatures that walk around in The Last of Us except they would smell like parmesan. Well either that or the dude would just get the worst diarrhea of his life like poop water for like 8 weeks straight or something. Really either is possible when you weigh it out. At number 5 we have Wolverine-ish. For this next one it really depends on what part of the story you look at to whether or not this will be a nightmare to you. So in Italy a body was found from someone who seemed to be from the 8th century. He was a pretty old dude and this guy had his arm chopped off right above the elbow. Now that is the scary part, someone amputating part of your body. No one wants to have their arm chopped off at any joint. But in place of his missing forearm was a big knife. This guy had a stump and then at the end of it was an engineered prosthetic that had a knife on it. He had a knife hand which I think is cool. As as hell. This guy could be walking around in the year 800 punch stabbing people like a G. Punch stab, punch stab, punch stab, punch stab, punch stab. This guy's cool as hell. But I can understand why that would scare people because you never want to be on the bad end of a guy punch stabbing you. At number 4 we have a gnawing sensation. The body of a Roman woman had a little surprise in her nether regions. And let me tell you it was not a sexy one. Not everything below the bell gets hot. In fact this was one of the most gross things that has ever been discovered and I never want to come in contact with anything like this ever again. Well this lady was found with a tumor in her pelvis 
pelvis. What was crazy about it is that the tumor was caused by an infected egg inside of her womb. This would cause the egg to partially develop and the tumor had teeth in it. Ugh. That sounds like something that should be pulled out of a horror movie. The living tumor that has come to take over your planet. You will all be slaves to this toothy monster. Because this lady happened to die before x-rays were even a concept, there's a good chance she had no idea what dental danger was inside her body. At number 3 we have vampires. As much as we complain about the world, it's nice to know that things used to be way worse. Like maybe you don't like your job, or maybe you were stuck in traffic, or maybe you even got dumped. But at least you weren't tortured to death because people thought you were a vampire. A tomb in Bulgaria uncovered a man from the 1200s who'd seemed to be horribly murdered, most likely by people who thought he was some sort of vampiric monster. It seemed that he was forced into a grave and then someone took a bladed weapon to his leg and hacked it off. And because the only way to kill a vampire is to stab it through its heart, they hammered a steel stake through this dude's chest pinning him to his own grave. Jokes on them, you have to use a wooden stick. So this guy rose from the dead to seek revenge. Just kidding, he died for sure. He was for sure dead. At number two, we have Pit of Sorrow. Something this list has taught me is that things have definitely got nicer over time. I know the world is imperfect, but this next point shows how commonplace brutality used to be. There was a pit found in Austria that had an entire tribe of people in it. 94 bodies were found and they were all dated back to 5200 BC. Now how did all these people from the tribe die in the same place? Well they were attacked and from the looks of it, it seemed like the opposing tribe came in to wipe them all out. Everyone in the pit had their head cracked open and then had their knees and legs snapped and some of them had arrowheads lodged in their backs. The thing that sent this over the edge is that 27 of the 94 bodies were children. This tribe, the attacking tribe made sure that everyone was Dead, except for women. There were only two female bodies found in the gravesite, so this most likely means that the women were all taken into slavery. Alright, for the number one spot, we have some hidden tunnels that were dug up in Chavin de Huantar in Peru. The tunnels zigzagged into all sorts of hidden rooms that could have been used as some sort of hiding place or escape route from invading tribes. But it seemed that the main thing that the tunnels were used for was sacrificing people in rituals. Several bodies were discovered that were dismembered in all sorts of strange ways. They would be strapped down to altars and then mutilated to death. Some of them had their heads chopped off and others seemed to have their hearts pulled out of their chest while they were still alive. Imagine someone putting a bag over your head in the middle of the night and then dragging you to some horrible underground lair and then cutting your still beating heart out of your chest. That's one hell of a Friday night. Starting off this countdown we have the chariot. A really cool artifact found in King Tut's tomb was his chariot. The chariot was found dismantled, but they ended up reconstructing it for display. Okay, first off, how did they build that ancient thing without any blueprints? That's talent right there, because I struggle building IKEA furniture even with blueprints. Now, what makes this artifact significant is that it's theorized that the chariot might have been King Tut's cause of death. King Tut was found with a fractured lower leg, shattered pelvis, and ribs. A new analysis shows that he was crushed on one side of his body likely while on his knees. So some believe that he fell from his chariot in a horrific accident and died. If this is the case, then that thing is most certainly cursed. Moving on at number 9, we have the meat mummy container. So apparently mummies get hungry on the way to the afterlife. As a result, they are often buried with food. The food is carefully preserved so that they can last a long time for their lengthy journey. This is done by preparing the meat for eating, then wrapping the meat in linen. So they basically mummify the meat. In King Tut's tomb, they found 48 containers of meat mummies. Guess King Tut is a big eater. Good thing that we took away his source of food from him. Like, come on guys, you're making the curse worse than it is. This dude's gonna be mad. I mean, I would be if people took away food from me. We all know how sacred food is. In our eighth spot, we have the toe and finger caps. This is one of the more odd items found in King Tut's tomb. So King Tut was found with gold toe caps on his feet and fingers. That's right. Just little golden covers for each individual toe and finger. These were placed on the divine after death so that their toes and fingers keep their shape. These were placed onto his body during mummification. It's also thought to protect the dead from magical dangers. Now, I'm hoping that they didn't remove these little caps from his body, but chances are they probably did. So, if anything happens to his digits, boy, he's gonna be mad. Coming in at number seven, we have the woven gloves. 
experts believe that this next piece is one of the few items that was actually used by King Tut while he was alive. International Egyptologist Tarek El Awadi said, and I quote, Most of the objects found in the tomb are ceremonial or designed to be used by the pharaoh in the afterlife. But he believes that these gloves were probably worn by King Tut, either during the winter time or when he was riding his royal chariot. That's pretty cool. I mean, the gloves don't look too stylish, but I think all of these ancient artifacts are so amazing. Moving on to number 6 we have the canopic jars. As part of their burial process, Egyptians would place the internal organs of the dead into four jars before mummification. One jar had King Tut's lungs, another had his stomach, another had his intestines, and one was for his liver. And apparently I say intestines wrong. That's how it is in Canada. Sorry. <laughs> the jars were found inside of an alabaster chest. It was thought that King Tut needed these organs in the afterlife, which is why they were preserved. Preserved. Not only that, but four goddesses protected them. But now these jars have been moved to the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. But his body is still in its original resting place. Great. So King Tut's body and his internal organs are kept separate. Bet he loves that. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the walking sticks. Among the countless artifacts Tut was buried with, a more interesting one would be his walking sticks. But he wasn't just buried with one walking stick. No, he was buried with 130 walking sticks. Why he needed that many is beyond me. So what we do know is that King Tut had a deformed left leg. People theorize that he had a rare bone disorder called Kohler's disease, and that's what caused this deformity. So it may just be that he needed a walking stick to get around. In fact, in tons of depictions he was drawn with this walking stick. Some think that it was just a royal staff. But with the newfound evidence of his foot, it's more likely that he needed them for mobility. And chances are, they're cursed. And they have been separated from King Tut's body. Meaning, he's stuck in the afterlife, probably hobbling around since we took away his sticks. Like come on people, stop angering the king. Coming in at number 4 we have Anubis. Guarding the entrance of King Tut's tomb was a statue of a black jackal on top of a podium. This jackal is known as Anubis, the god of the afterlife. Anubis is said to protect the dead, guarding their spirits from trespassers. The jackal was 3 feet long, made of wood and plaster. This was then painted black, which is the symbolic color of Anubis. Black was chosen since it represents death and decay, but it also symbolizes the fertile soil of the Nile and regeneration. It's crazy how much detail was put into these things. So Anubis was placed outside of King Tut's tomb as kind of a no trespassing sign. But we trespassed, so now it's cursed. I mean, it's said that Anubis punishes the mortals who ignore its warning and disturb the dead. In our third spot, we have Tut's burial mask. Tut's burial mask, otherwise known as a death mask, was found in King Tut's coffin resting directly on the shoulders of his mummy. Okay, with a name like death mask, gotta be cursed. So these masks were made to resemble the person that it was placed on. It was done so that the spirits could recognize the body after death and help them to the underworld. The mask was filled with oils which helped with the mummification process. Not only that, but at the back of the mask there was a protective spell inscribed into it. The spell was to protect Tut's limbs as he travels to the underworld. Now, according to rumors, Tut's beard on the mask was accidentally snapped off and then glued back on. So not only did they remove a protective mask from King Tut, but they broke it too. Yeah, King Tut is probably really upset about that. Let's hope this didn't interfere with him getting into the underworld. Coming in at number 2 we have King Tut. So obviously one of the biggest discoveries in King Tut's tomb was King Tut himself. He was buried in a coffin, placed inside another coffin, inside another coffin, inside another coffin. There were 8 coffins in total. So like I mentioned before, anyone that handles King Tut's body or his artifacts are said to be cursed. After Tut's body was found, he was sent to a radiologist to get x-rayed. The radiologist's name was Sir Archibald Douglas Reed. The next day, after conducting the x-ray, Reed fell sick. He died three days later. His death is blamed on King Tut's curse. 
And in our number one spot, we have the Cobra staff. So this is where it gets interesting. Rumor has it that the reason why several men mysteriously died after the expedition was because one of the workers stole King Tut's Cobra staff. Howard Carter claimed that when they found the tomb, it was already robbed. But he may have said that to cover up the fact that him and his team took a couple of artifacts as souvenirs, particularly the Cobra staff. Ironically enough, one of Carter's team members, James Henry Breasted, returned home to find his pet canary eaten by a cobra. And the cobra was still occupying the cage. Hmm. A cobra staff goes missing, and a cobra is found in his home. Coincidence? I think not. So what I learned from today's video is that King Tut has been separated from a lot of his artifacts. He is out there hungry, unable to walk with broken fingers and toes, and without his protector or his organs. So yeah, chances are he's really pissed at us and is cursing us. Coming in at number 10, we have the sarcophagus of Menkarur. The great pyramids house some of the most important people of their day. You have to imagine if thousands of people died to build a monument just to put a dead body in, then you'd have to be someone pretty important. I'll be lucky if my ashes get kept in a mayonnaise jar. But one of the pyramids of Giza was the sarcophagus of Menkarur. This was found by British explorer Howard Weiss. This should be no surprise, this was back in the 1800s, and we all know how much the English love to come through and take everything. One of the craziest things about Weiss's excavation of the pyramids was the fact that he used explosives to blast his way inside. This dude clearly had a ton of respect for the architecture. Eventually this guy's demolition style of getting into a pyramid got him what he wanted. He was face to face with the sarcophagus of Menakur. He hauled this thing out and then he slapped it on a boat to send it back to England. Well, on the way back the boat sank and since then the treasure has been lost to man. Coming in at number nine, we have the menorah of the second temple. The English weren't the only ones who would go around taking cool stuff from cool places. I mean, let's be honest. If we go back in time far enough, we will find that every group of people took things from everywhere. Well, the Romans thought that they would take a trip down to Jerusalem to steal the menorah of the second temple. They didn't destroy it, but they brought it back to the temple of peace. That is a very strange thing to call a place where you keep a bunch of stolen artifacts from foreign places. Like, oh, this is the temple of peace? How did you get that menorah? Ruthless blood Shed? Yeah, that seems nice. Well, the Temple of Peace was eventually burnt to the ground and it's unknown if the menorah of the second temple survived this. Really, there's two options here. Either it was destroyed along with the temple or it was taken to Carthage by a group of people called the Vandals. And guys, remember to hit that like button because it really helps us out. Coming in at number eight, we have the Barber Dimes. Now, the first thing that comes to mind when I say the Barber Dimes is me walking out with a fresh haircut. You know what I'm saying? But this is actually something much more valuable than me looking really, really good. The Barber Dimes were minted back in 1907 and they used to be very common, but now there's only a few of them left. That's not the part that makes this story so interesting. There is a treasure of missing Barber Dimes that could be somewhere in Colorado. Six massive barrels of Barber Dimes were transported through Colorado and back in 1907, they never showed up to their destination. They could have been stolen or they could have fallen into the Colorado Black Canyon. If you were to find this stash of dimes today, because of how rare they are and how many there are, they would be worth millions of dollars. So not a bad find. Coming in at number seven, we have Sappho's poems. Sappho is considered one of the greatest minds of ancient Greece. And while there's quite a bit of her work that the world has been able to salvage, it would seem that her poems were lost to the world. I'm not one to dip into poems that often or really ever, but it would have been so interesting to see what poetry looked like in ancient Greece. Also, so much of the literature and knowledge from that era was written and cataloged by men. So it would be cool to see what that era looked like through the eyes of a woman. I mean, I suspect that it would all be insightful pieces that opened up my mind, but they might have just been love stories or the regular frustrations of typical poetry. I don't know, dude. They were lost and we can't read them. I would hope that one day we find these poems and everyone thinks that they're beautiful and they change the way we interact with each other. But when 
she wrote them, she thought that they all sucked. That would be very funny. Coming in at number six, we have the Lost Library of the Moscow Tsars. One of the greatest groupings of ancient writings was put together by the Grand Duchy of Moscow. He collected writings from several ancient civilizations, including the ancient Greeks, the ancient Romans, and it's thought that many others were also housed in this place. The location and contents of this library were always very secret. It became an even bigger secret when Ivan the Terrible was in power. It said that Ivan hid the library so the knowledge would never leak into anyone's hands except his own. Well, we know that Ivan was eventually killed in a revolution, and it's thought that the location of the library was also lost with him. Either that or the people revolting decided to burn the writings, not knowing what they were or how to read them. Or the library could still be somewhere out in Moscow waiting to be discovered. It would be a great find that would open up the world to a priceless collection of literature from a almost forgotten time. Coming in at number five, we have Blackbeard's treasure. Blackbeard spent two long years out at sea as a pirate. Before that, he worked as a privateer and probably thought the money was trash, and that's why he turned to sinking boats and stealing booty. The boat he rode on was the Queen Mary's Revenge, which is one of the most badass things I have ever heard. But eventually, the law caught up with him and his head was chopped off. But this dude was a little rascal. Before he died, he let everyone know that he had a massive treasure buried somewhere, but he didn't tell anyone where it was. Now, this might have been a pirate's bluff. Something to send out to the world so he would never be forgotten and send a bunch of hopeful men out to sea looking for something that wasn't there. Or maybe he was telling the truth. And there's a multi-million dollar prize hidden away somewhere. Coming in at number four, we have the Bayeux Tapestry's final panels. Recording history before the printing press was hard. You had to either write everything down by hand or make a super long tapestry like this one. There's no recording it on your phone and then uploading it into the cloud where it will live forever in a file that no one will ever look at. The Bayeux Tapestries was created when William the Conqueror smashed through England and reshaped Europe forever. People think it took years to make, but the last chunk is missing, so there's no conclusion to the story. To this day, no one knows where these final panels are. That would be like if thousands of years from now, someone dug up the entire Marvel Cinematic Universe and everything was there right up to the point where Thanos grabbed the gauntlet from Stark and then it stopped. You know how much that would suck, dude? Give me the end of the story. I need it. I didn't even know this thing was missing until right now and I'm already rattled. Coming in at number three, we have JFK's brain. Here's a very strange one. Someone went out of their way to take the brain of the President of the United States after he was assassinated. No one knows who took his brain or where his brain went. There's a lot of theories about this. Some people think it could have been the FBI or the CIA to cover up that there was a second shooter. Other people think that his brother took his brain as evidence. Some people think that the government hid his brain because it revealed that he was slowly dying from some sickness and they wanted that to be hidden from the public. No matter what the case, it seems like it would be pretty hard to lose track of someone's brain when that someone is the president who was just assassinated by being shot in the head. The brain would be something you would want to hold on to for a very long time. Coming in at number two, we have the Honjo Masamune. This is the last known sword made by the person believed to be the best sword maker of all time. The sword was made somewhere between 1260 and 1340 and passed down from generation to generation. It probably would have outlasted all of us because the craftsmanship is so exquisite, but after World War II, there was an order from the Allies to take all weapons from Japanese people in Japan. This stretched to even historical weapons. Once it passed hands from its last owner to the Allied forces, its location was lost to man. The sword might have been thrown in the ocean, it might have been melted down, it might have been stolen and now is kept somewhere safe. But if you are the greatest sword maker in Japan, then that would put you in the running for the greatest sword maker in the world who has ever made swords ever. So this weapon that now is lost could be the greatest remaining sword on the planet. And coming into the number one spot, we have Genghis Khan's grave. Probably one of the most ruthless conquerors of all time, this dude had the largest empire in history. The Mongolians are the only people to beat Russia in a land war in the winter. He spread his seed so much that 1% of the planet has his DNA, and he killed so many people that it actually lowered the temperature of the planet. And if we look back to where he came from, he basically was living in a village of tents. You want to talk about starting from the bottom, now you're here? This guy did it bigger than anyone. And to cap 
all of this off. After he was done, he didn't want to be remembered. He didn't want anyone to pray to him or fear him or use him as a force to control other people. He wouldn't let anyone paint a picture of him when he was alive. So anything we see of him was made after he died. So all these images could be highly inaccurate. And he also hid the location of his grave. Genghis Khan requested that he be buried at an unmarked grave in the heart of the Birkin Kaldun Mountains. Then everyone who was part of the burial was killed so no one would know the location. And it's rumored that horses were released up the hills so no one could follow tracks. Obviously this guy caused more death than anyone else but this is still something crazy. Starting off in our number 10 spot we have a tiny creepy hand. This small lifelike bronze hand was found at the Roman fort of Vindolanda which is near Hadrian's Wall in England. This artifact was found by archaeologists and it quickly became quite a mysterious find. The reason for this is because of the fact that it is believed that this artifact may have been associated with a cult. This cult called Jupiter Dolichenus after the Roman god of course is a mystery cult that held their secrets close to their chest. The secretive cult existed and was very popular with the Roman army around the third century. This hand is believed to have been left as an offering after there was a major invasion of Scotland that left a large number of people dead. Little more about this bronze statue is known and that just might make it even creepier. In our number 9 spot today we have vampire remains. A few years ago in Poland during a dig researchers uncovered some skeletal remains that date back to the 14th century and if this find wasn't already gruesome enough they quickly figured out this wasn't where the story ended. These skeletons appeared to have posthumous injuries inflicted onto them. Wondering why? Someone's fear of vampires is probably to blame. The skeletons had been decapitated and punctured at the spine, which is extremely gruesome, and then the severed heads were wedged between heavy stones. This is what the lore at the time suggested was the appropriate actions for those who might be vampires in order to prevent them from rising from the dead again. As it turns out, as many of us now know, unfortunately, many of these people who were said to be supernatural or evil were probably just suffering from diseases of life. According to researchers, during this time period, people who were suffering from things like kyphosis or perhaps cholera were often thought of as being vampires or witches. In our number 8 spot today, we have Jerry Bibb Balasok's gravestone. This tombstone goes hand in hand with an absolutely insane story of Jerry's life. The story of it is that Jerry, who was a professional wrestler, ended up vanishing after getting in trouble with the law. He was wanted for charges of fraud and while no one knew his whereabouts for six months, when his mother picked up a magazine one day which featured the victims of the horrible cultist Jonestown massacre, she sadly saw her son's picture alongside all of the others. This led to there being a tombstone of course made for Jerry, although his body would have already been buried in California. So this all happened in 1978 but let's flash forward to 1990. In that year a man named Ricky A. Weta was arrested for attempting to take someone's life. He was fingerprinted upon his arrest and who would have thought Ricky turned out to be none other than the presumed dead Jerry. The whole story was of course national news because how could this have possibly happened? In the end Jerry was caught and brought to justice. But here's the thing, the tombstone. It's a reminder of the Jonestown Massacre. In our number 7 spot today we have the Vampire of Dusseldorf. If you've ever been to a Ripley Believe It or Not Museum, you know those places are stocked full of the weird and wonderful and this item is absolutely no different. This Wisconsin museum holds the skull from the severed head of the vampire of Dusseldorf, Peter Carton. Who is Peter? Well this vampire man was actually a German serial killer from the 1930s. This man committed some incredibly atrocious acts for which he was tried and convicted. He ended up being found guilty for the killing of nine people as well as attempting to take the lives of seven more. This guilty verdict led to him being sentenced to beheading, which took place in 1931 when Peter was 48 years old. I'm not exactly sure why anyone would have wanted to keep his head and skull around, but clearly it happened and now people can go and visit it whenever they feel like it. This might be one museum I might stay away from to be perfectly honest. I've learned about way too many cursed items here and don't want to mess around with this one. In our number 6 spot today we have this viking sword. 
sword. Archaeologists found a Viking sword called Ulfbear that they were able to date somewhere from 800 to 1000 AD, but upon further research, they were absolutely astounded at what they found. This sword was made with a level of sophistication that wasn't seen until at least 800 years later. The carbon content of the sword is three times higher than other swords of the time, and due to the impurities that were removed, the iron ore would have needed to be heated to at least 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. This sword was so hard to believe to researchers that a blacksmith named Richard Furrer made a sword similar to this one and used technology that would have been available at the time of its making. He said that the process was the most complicated thing he had ever made, and he even ended up using methods that weren't known to be used at the time. This is all super cool and stuff, but it has me wondering what this sword was used for and what dark parts of history it holds. In our number five spot today, we have shackled skeletons. On an archeological dig in 2016, researchers uncovered a scary site. Buried in the grounds in Athens, Greece, were at least 80 skeletons, all arranged in neat rows, all with iron shackles on their wrists. Stella Chrysalaki, who was the head of the excavation site, said, quote, they're all tied at the hands with handcuffs and most of them are very, very young and in a very good state of health when they were executed. This definitely adds a little bit of horror to this already gruesome scene. Apparently, the method of burial suggests that whoever these skeletons belong to weren't just the average run-of-the-mill lawbreakers, and they may have been in trouble for some more serious crimes. It is believed that these skeletons might be the supporters of a man named Cylon. In 632 BC, Cylon, who was a former athlete, led an attempted coup in Athens. Of course, since I just called it attempted, it didn't work out, but apparently he then fled the city unharmed. Since he couldn't be punished for his crimes, that only leaves these souls who were just finally uncovered a few years ago. I know these are people who once lived and not artifacts, but I had to put them on this list today because this discovery and story are just something we have to be talking about. In our number four spot today, we have the Skurid Inn Beam. The Skurid Inn in Wales, upon first glance, just looks like a great place to enjoy some classic pub fare, maybe some fish and chips and a nice ale. But the history it holds tells a very different story because this used to be a place for public hangings. Seems like a weird spot for a pub now, doesn't it? The upper part of the inn used to be the courthouse where people were tried and convicted, and then if the case was made, they were executed on site. It is estimated that around 180 hangings took place right in that spot. They even made the weird decision to keep the original hanging beam up, and the grooves of where the rope wore into the wood can still be seen even to this day. Also, the inn has chosen to keep the original cells where the prisoners were kept just to add the maximum amount of creepiness to the entire place. It's probably haunted as well. This beam serves as a reminder of a different time, I guess, but if we're being totally honest, have things really changed all that much? In our number three spot today, we have these sacrificial offerings. In 2018, researchers sent some remote operated robots beneath the ground in Peru at Chavin de Juan Tar. These robots stumbled on more than anyone ever imagined when they found a network of 35 interlocked underground tunnels dating back 3,000 years. This is already fascinating and cool, and I have a ton of questions about this whole series of mysterious tunnels, but we've got to save that for another video video and instead talk about what it was they found inside of these tunnels, and that is the remains of at least three individuals. They had found more remains of other people, but these three skeletons specifically stood out because they weren't like the others. They weren't the skeletons of people who had high social standings. These remains they found were from people who were actually sacrificed in rituals. They were able to determine this because of the fact that these bodies were found face down under piles of rocks, which is of course course, not how people of a high social standing would have been buried at the time. This discovery certainly is a reminder of different times on Earth. In our number two spot today, we have an executioner axe. In a Swedish museum, there is an axe that dates back to between 1770 and 1866. This axe isn't just any old axe, however, as it once belonged to an executioner who used it on 88 people. Execution by axe, as you can imagine, was a lot more difficult in reality than movies make it seem, so these axes 
axes were specially designed. Rather than being a finely tuned piece of weaponry, these axes were simply designed to crush their way through flesh and vertebrae. I'll save you any more horrible descriptions and just say that the executioner didn't have an easy job for a variety of reasons, and it certainly was a job that required them to stay in great shape. Like I mentioned with the Skurid Inbeam, it's definitely good that things have changed since the days of public beheadings for capital punishment, but sometimes things don't really even seem all that different. In our number one spot today, we have the Tower of Skulls. There's a city in Serbia that has an interesting tourist attraction. This tower dates back to a time when Serbia was still under Ottoman control in 1809. The first Serbian uprising was not going well, but the leader of the rebels, Stephen Sindelic, was determined to do something to change that. During the final stand at Seagar Hill, Stephen fired a round into a keg of gunpowder, which was inside of a fully stocked armory. You can only guess what this did. Of course, it caused a massive explosion that killed not only him and his men, but also all of the Turkish soldiers who were storming the trenches. In order to get their revenge on this move that Stephen made, the Turks then collected all of the rebels' bodies and removed their heads. They took the bodies of 952 rebels and sent them to Constantinople as trophies. And what did they do with the heads? Well, they built a tower, of course. This tower was 15 feet high and the Turks built it right at the entrance to town. The Skull Tower was intended to be a reminder to not mess with them, but the Serbians decided to use their new metal as heck Skull Tower to show them what they were really made of. Starting off with number 10 is the inspection card. Passenger Marion meanwhile originally had different travel plans, but when a coal strike delayed her scheduled trip on the Majestic, she came aboard the Titanic. On the inspection card, you can see her name and the Majestic crossed out and replaced with the Titanic instead. Marion didn't survive the shipwreck and the card really just makes you think. They were probably on a time constraint rushing to get somewhere and thought if the Titanic is the quickest and soonest way to get there, then the Titanic it'll be. Not having any idea of what that split decision would do. But then again, none of them knew, right? Coming in at number 9 is Amy. A bracelet was recovered from the shipwreck of the Titanic and auctioned off a hundred years after the ship sank. The bracelet itself looks like a gold chain and it has Amy in the middle made from silver and diamonds. Honestly there was something about it that just struck me as eerie. Maybe it's the fact that Amy is probably dead right now and she could have been wearing that when the ship hit the iceberg and everything was just going down. And I think it's all the possibilities behind the bracelet which is what makes it scary. Was she sliding to the other side of the ship and the bracelet got caught on something and came off? Was it part of her luggage that went down with the ship? We'll never know. Maybe it didn't even belong to an Amy. Maybe a man had gotten it for his wife or girlfriend and was going to give it to her when the ship docked. We'll just never know. At number 8 we have the plan. This was the blueprint of the Titanic drawn by the naval architects department at White Star Line, which was the company that owned the Titanic. Sold for 308,000 euros at an auction, the plan is actually one of the most important important pieces of memorabilia we have because it was heavily used for investigation after the disaster to see if the ship itself had any role to play in the crash. Were there any faulty areas, any super vulnerable spots that perhaps they missed in planning, etc. Witnesses and survivors of the crash were shown the plan so they could point out where exactly the ship hit the iceberg and those points are still marked onto the plan. The drawing itself is an actual marvel. It's a whopping 9.2 meters long which surprised me initially but given how big the star line was herself, it just doesn't surprise me at all. Filling our number 7 slot is the trunk. There are many stories explaining why Howard Irwin never boarded the Titanic when he was meant to. One story was that because he was a heavy gambler, he was beaten up and kidnapped and forced to work on a ship going to the Middle East. That's some Jason Bourne ting right there. He was supposed to go to New York with his friend Henry Sutor and so when Henry got on the ship on April 10th, he brought Howard's trunk with him expecting to meet him later on. And of course he never did. They recovered at Howard's trunk from the shipwreck and he's obviously still alive, hopefully back home and not still working on a ship somewhere, but his friend Henry didn't survive. Now at number 6 are the keys. They actually did a really good job of conserving these keys. I thought they'd be rusty and old and water damaged, but they look like they're in tip top shape. This specific set was used by Titanic crewman Samuel Hemming, who was the storekeeper of the ship. He was ordered to use it to unlock the door where the lifeboat lanterns were kept to make sure all 15 lifeboats had lit oil lamps. This this was done soon after the captains realized doom was inevitable and that there was no way they were going to avoid the iceberg. Honestly, just imagine being told you have to do that and why. He was probably trying to comprehend near imminent death whilst making sure all the lamps were on. Real MVP right there. 
You go, Samuel. Coming in at number five is the violin. Sold for 1.5 million euros, this violin belonged to Wallace Hartley, who was part of the band who did live entertainment for the ship. Now, if you've seen the movie, you know that the violin player starts playing when the ship goes down, and the rest of the band just joins in to kind of, you know, mask the sound of chaos and death around everyone. And you'd think that that was just for effect, since it is a movie and they're trying to pull at your heartstrings, but it actually happened. Wallace did grab his violin during the ship's last few critical moments and started playing Nearer My God to Thee, inspiring his bandmates to do the same. Honestly, imagine that being the soundtrack of your death. I don't know if I'm into it. At number four is the robe. I think the robe was meant to be beige originally, but after spending so long on the ocean floor, it turned this light greenish color. The silk kimono style robe was worn by a first class passenger called Lucy Christiana, whereas other reports say it was worn by Lady Duff Gordon. Either way, she wore it as she was escaping the ship and hurrying into a lifeboat, and then later the RMS Carpathia. Honestly, that is a fancy ass getaway outfit if I ever saw one, but I'm not even surprised. I feel like people probably just ran for safety, regardless of if they were wearing a three piece suit or were completely naked. I would have taken it off, you know, to be able to run faster, but they were also getting into lifeboats into freezing water, so the cover up makes complete sense. Filling our number three slot is the pocket watch. To 2008, this was actually the most expensive Titanic artifact sold in an auction. It was sold for 130,000 euros, which is around around 146,000 USD. It belonged to a first class steward on the ship called Edmund Stone, who also owned the master keys to the whole first class cabin, so he was pretty up there. Eerily enough, the watch stopped ticking at exactly 2.16 am, which would have been around the time Edmund landed in the ice cold water of the ocean. Now this is a proper relic frozen in time. I feel when I read that sentence while I was researching this video, it almost made me flash back to seeing this man's arm go into the Atlantic Ocean, even though I wasn't even there. It Honestly, gives me chills, and I don't know if it's because the fact it stopped when he died is freaky, or I'm just imagining this cold water all over me. Let me know. Actually, you can't. Scratch that. Now at number two is the last lifeboat. Collapsible A was the last lifeboat to leave the Titanic. Not everyone survived, but most of them were saved by Oceanic. A month after the sinking, it was recovered and workers were doing their best to patch it back up. But what they found inside the lifeboat made them speechless. Inside Collapsible A, they found the decomposing bodies of three passengers. One was wearing a dinner jacket, later identified as first class passenger Thompson Beatty, and the other two bodies were firemen that had just been stuffed under the lifeboat seats. One of their arms even came off as the boarding officer was trying to move them. A wedding ring was found too, but I guess Oceanic left the dead bodies behind when they were saving the rest. The ring belonged to Elon Lindell, who got to the lifeboat but later drowned. Her husband held the ring on collapsible A till he too died, and his body has never been recovered. And finally, at number one is the letter. I think this is one of the most profound artifacts that was recovered from the Titanic, but also one of the most spine chilling. April 14th, 1912, the Titanic hit the iceberg. Two and a half hours later, the ship sank with 1,500 people aboard. During that two and a half hours, first class passenger Dr. Washington Dodge decided to write a letter. Even his name sounds bougie, I'm not surprised he was first class. In the letter, he vividly describes the ship's final hours, the sinking, the chaos, the loss. It's one of the earliest, most immediate accounts of the disaster ever found. His handwriting is all over the place, which I'm sure you can understand given his state of mind. But he did in fact survive the shipwreck, so I guess it wasn't all bad after all. I mean, what am I saying? It, it, it was all bad. It was all bad. Coming up in our number 10 spot, we have a throwing spear. A throwing spear that was approximately crafted over 10,300 years ago was discovered by Dr. Craig Lee from Montana State University in 2007. It was discovered in northern Wyoming. 10,300 years ago, holy moly. Just saying that is so trippy and hard to wrap my brain around the idea of people existing at that point. But in any case, this spear at first glance appeared just like a stick, but then after closer inspection, he discovered that it was a dart from a throwing spear. At this point, it is the oldest frozen artifact found yet. It's been a source of inspiration for others to continue the hunt for artifacts that are being revealed as a result of melting ice patches, and it certainly has created a sense of urgency for people to get hunting for these unbelievable items. In our number nine spot, we have the Yukon Treasures. A size 4 moccasin shoe from 1400 years ago was found melting in the Yukon and my inner shopaholic is super excited about it. So of course I had to include it on this list. 
Along with the shoe, two other items were found. A barbed antler projectile point from about 1200 years ago, and throwing darts from 9,000 years ago. Apparently they were found by a husband and wife in 1997 who were hunting doll sheep in the Yukon mountains when they smelt something extremely strange. It was dung, yes, poop, from a caribou. But the thing is, caribou hadn't been in this area for many, many years, so they decided to inspect it. <laughs> Naturally? <laughs> I wouldn't. Anyways, I guess they discovered that the poop was from thousands of years ago that had frozen into ice, and close behind it were these artifacts that had melted along with it. Pretty wild. In our number eight spot, we have animal hair rope. While out exploring the mountaintops of Western Mongolia, archeologist and researcher Isaac Hart of the University of Utah discovered something quite interesting that he felt would truly help with discovering more about the Mongolia people in ancient times. They discovered a finely woven piece of animal hair rope. This rope was first thought to have been dropped in the ice recently. However, after scientists performed some radiocarbon tests on it to see how old it was, it was proven to be more than 1,500 years old. Wow, that's some old rope. In our number seven spot, we have horn curls. On this same trip, looking for more artifacts, Isaac Hart found some Argali sheep skulls and horn curls from 1,500 years ago, which were stacked in a pile by ancient hunters. And this finding completely discounted some old assumptions about the Mongolian people in the past. They were long thought to be herding societies, but these findings show that perhaps they were big hunters on mountain ice. Wow, sometimes just talking about this just makes me feel super grateful to be alive live today. Although we are all wimps now, just going outside when it's cold, you know, I'm already looking for the outdoor heater. Where's the outdoor heater? <laughs> What are we in ancient times? In our number six spot, we have Iron Age tunic. Apparently, as Norway's glaciers begin to melt, archaeologists are beginning to uncover a ridiculous amount of ancient treasures, and some say it is about 2,000 plus items to date. One of the most notable items, in my opinion, is some recovered clothing that was found. Honestly, not one item is better than the other. They all tell a story from the past and help us better understand how mountain populations lived. But still, I think it is so cool cool to see that they found some clothing that's approximately from 300 AD, an Iron Age tunic to be exact. That's not that old though compared to some of the other items that were found on this dig that were approximately 4,000 years old, but still, pretty cool. And one of the older items that was found is in our number five spot today, which is the walking stick. Now this item also is not as old as some of the throwing darts that were found, but it's so unique and cool that I had to put it on the list. It's not just any old walking stick. It's a walking stick with runic inscription. Whoa, so cool. I actually have rocks with ruins on them at home that I bought from like a new AG store and I love to look at them. Ruins are truly fascinating and quite beautiful. So I'm a big believer in symbology and the energy and power infused in symbols. So anyways, when I saw this recovered walking stick from the 11th century AD, I kind of freaked out and needed to share. In our number four spot, we have arrowheads. This is actually so cool. The entire video has been so fun to research, but finding this out was very interesting. I definitely need to go to museums more. I don't think I knew that I enjoyed history so much. Anyways, in 2003, a hiker was walking in a mountain pass near Sion, Switzerland, when he came across some treasures. Not gold, sadly, but what he found were items that are arguably way cooler from a Stone Age hunter from over 3,000 years ago. They were fragments of a bow, an arrow case, arrowheads, and leg coverings, all believed to be revealed due to the ice in the glaciers melting due to the rapidly changing climate. Pretty crazy. Imagine just going for a hike and discovering some ancient artifacts. I bet you there will never be a more interesting moment in your life. Although fine, the birth of your future child could be fairly special too. In our number three spot, we have the Viking whisks. Technically not considered ancient artifacts, but I thought this was cool and it needed an honorable mention. The melting of glaciers in Norway has actually revealed a lost mountain pass, and with it, hundreds of Viking artifacts have been discovered. The pass was discovered back in 2011, as ever since, the glaciers have continued to melt and more and more artifacts have been recovered. 
recovered. The archaeologists believe the pass was used from the Roman Iron Age 300 AD to the Viking Age 1000 AD. From horseshoes to sled fragments to wooden needles to wooden whisks, all kinds of artifacts have been recovered. One of the most unique items include a Viking mitten and a blue textile rug. Wow, imagine finding a rug frozen on a mountain. Also, it's just wild to think that the Vikings had rugs. All I can think of when I think of Vikings is war. So, it's probably just me and my limited imagination due to my limited knowledge of history. In our number two spot, we have arrowheads. Over 100,000 artifacts were recently uncovered in a place called Nunalik in Alaska. These artifacts belong to the Yupik peoples who lived there. There have been stories told over many centuries of a gruesome massacre that occurred during the Bow and Arrow War Days, which was a series of long, brutal battles. Up until recently, the area had been frozen in the subsoil known as permafrost. The most notable items that were found were the slate arrow points that further proved the stories that have been told about these war times. Although these items aren't technically ancient, they are truly a wonder for archaeologists to discover and I thought it needed to be on this list. In our number one spot, we have an ancient lunchbox. A 3,500 year old lunchbox was discovered in Switzerland in the Swiss Alps. No, it didn't have a 3,500 year old cheese sandwich in it, but it did have traces of ancient cereal. Whoa, some ancient dude was just walking around the Alps eating an ancient version of Lucky Charms. The lunchbox is a Bronze Age wooden container and apparently the food traces were of wheat and barley or rye grains. The lunchbox was made from Swiss pine and its rim was made from willow sewn together with European larch twigs. It was found in a melting ice patch in 2012. That's incredible. Probably my fave find on this list, but anything to do with food just makes me excited. Excuse me as I go pour myself a bowl of Lucky Charms. Feel free to join me if you like. At number 10, the Dead Book Box. Now, do you remember that the 2012 movie The Possession was based on a true story? Well, that story was based on a Dead Book Box. Now that specific box that the movie was based on is one that now Zach Bagans has at his haunted museum. And this box is actually a wine cabinet that is allegedly haunted by a Dead Book. And now, a debug is Yiddish for a malicious possessing spirit that people believe to be a dislocated soul of a dead person. And so it becomes trapped in an object, like this wine box, until a person helps release the spirit. Now in Baggins box, it's believed the restless spirit can possess the living, and that's why Zach Baggins is keeping the cabinet closed, because he's a little bit scared of it himself, I would think. Now, the box was originally posted on eBay for sale by a man named Kevin Manis, who was having a ton of trouble with it. Anytime he gave it as a gift to someone, they experienced strange issues and its darkness and it passed through the hands of others afterwards as they would each have their own unnerving experiences with the box. At Zach Baggins Museum, if you want to see the box, you must insist to see it and be 18 years of age or older and sign a liability waiver because they're not joking around. <laughs> now, not all exhibits at the museum stay open all the time. At number 9, we have The Devil's Rocking Chair. Baggins acquired a rocking chair that was owned by the family whose stories are probably what inspired The Conjuring 3. Now, this was the devil made me do it case in the early 80s. During stories talking about David Glatzel's possession, Ed and Lorraine Warren said the rocking chair would rock on its own, levitate, and even vanish and reappear. Now, David and Lorraine also claimed to have seen the devil sitting in it. So, Take that as you will. Now, with all this spooky stuff in mind, Zach Baggins was just sold. He was like, I need this chair. This is, of course, though, a thing that happened on the opening night of the Devil Chair exhibit where he was like, look at this cool chair. Five people bawled uncontrollably and one woman collapsed. So according to TMZ, just a few hours after Baggins opened the exhibit, he shut down the exhibit. But then, a couple weeks later, opened it back up, less issues. But that opening night started with a bang. But on to number eight, Jack's fan. Now another thing Baggins has is Dr. Jack Kevorkian's assisted suicide van. Nicknamed Dr. Death, Kevorkian helped over 100 people with terminal illnesses and their lives during the 90s. He did his time for prison for eight years under charges of second degree murder and died in 2011 at the age of 83. Now, there is obviously a wide contrast in views on what took place in this van. Some see what the doctor did as monstrous and pin him as a murderer, while others paint him as an activist who wanted to make sure those who wanted to pass did so painlessly and on their own terms. 
Either way, heightened emotions can come to those who see the van and fear may be one of them. And that might be one reason that Zach Baggins was like, I want this in my haunted museum. So let's go on to number seven. Another thing there, Bella Lugosi's mirror. Now this mirror has many stories attached to it, especially since its namesake comes from its connection to Bella Lugosi. And now if that isn't ringing any bells, he is most well known for playing Dracula in the 1931 film. So quite a ways back. Now guides of the tour at the museum say that Lugosi would use the mirror as a medium for scrying and trying to talk to his dead wife. But the truth is the only confirmed connection is that it was originally said to have once been in Bella Lugosi's house. Plus none of his five wives died while he was married to them and there is no documentation of him participating in the occult. But the mirror has seen some things. It was in the room when Frank Selatry was mysteriously murdered, a crime that still has not been solved. He was found bound up in the master bedroom with a single gunshot in the back of his head. So maybe those who let their minds wander while looking into this mirror fall ill when they project those ideas onto the mirror, or maybe the mirror itself has the capacity to haunt and curse those who look into it. Now people say they've seen entities reach out to them through the mirror or have the sensation of having their necks bitten while looking into it. but. Nothing has been confirmed. On to number six, John Morrell's preserved thumb. And now, I don't know exactly what Zach Baggins is saying about this thumb, but it's not John Morrell's. Now, he's probably basing his information off an incredulous book written by Virgil Stewart, and the backstory is John Morrell in this book is said to be an occult leader and the head of the Mystic Clan that's purpose was to steal slaves to plan an overthrowing of authority. But this book was written by Virgil Stewart, who wrote it in an attempt to get more clout after capturing John Morrell, who was likely just a horse thief and a slave stealer. Now, Stewart just kind of blew the situation completely out of proportion to try to get more street cred. So while the thumb is real and a real thumb, it's not murals who probably died in prison and was buried with all of his thumbs on him. And now that's not to say what it stands for isn't scary. People in Mississippi read the book and believed in it, believed in what Stewart was saying. In Tennessee, they knew the truth because they knew Stewart and he was just fabricating things. But in Mississippi, Ooh, Nelly, they were suspicious of one another so much. The summer of 1835, people in Mississippi were killing one another and their innocent slaves on the off chance any of them was part of this mystic clan, which is a clan that didn't exist. So now you know the harm in falsifying stories, you can see how this little thumb is a creepy bugger and a symbolism of something bigger than it is. So worth it in a way to have at the museum. Now, another scary thing at number five, a cauldron previously owned by Ed Gein. Zach Baggins bought this cauldron at an auction and apparently it was found in a shed on the Old Gein property. And if you need a refresher on who Old Gein was, he was a grave robber and murderer that would experiment on human bodies, making masks of human skin to wear around the house and use skulls as soup bowls. So no, I'm not kidding. This was his cauldron and, okay, what's the big deal, right? It's a cauldron. Well, it turns out, according to the person who auctioned off this item, Ed Gein stored body parts and blood in this cauldron in his shed. Now, obviously, as a collector of the horrendous and haunting, Baggins decided he needed it, and now it's on display. Now, one thing is for sure, that cauldron would make some killer soup. <laughs> At number four, Charles Manson's portraits. Another thing in this haunted museum is a portrait of Charles Manson. And now the portrait isn't just haunting due to it being of a mass murderer and cult leader. No, it's haunting because when you look into the eyes of this image, you are looking at Charles Manson. Well, in a way, you're looking at his ashes. The artist of the portrait, Ryan Almighty, used parts of Charles Manson's ashes for the eyes of this piece. And even wilder, Almighty achieved the reddish brown hues of the piece by using his own blood as the pigment. So this piece really is a little piece of the artist and his muse. Creepy. Now let's go to number three demon house staircase. So you may think a staircase doesn't have much inherent scary ideas attached to it, and you're not wrong, but this staircase was a part of a whirlwind scary experience. Latoya Amons and her three children allegedly underwent demonic possession in the house the stairs originated from. While living there while renting, Amons and her children experienced possession and terrifying experiences like walking up walls, floating over a bed, and feeling choked. So very haunting experiences. And all this escalated to the point that the Catholic Church backed up a priest who performed three exorcisms on Amons. And then the family relocated for their own safety with the help of Department of Child Services, and Zach Baggins then bought the house. He was interested with the reported demonic possessions and stories and explored the house until he demolished it, thinking, 
better done with it. He only kept a staircase and a little bit of carpet that's sealed off in a room in his museum that's voluntary for visitors to see, and even voluntary for staff to see because of the entities associated with it. Which is very nice for the staff members. It's like, it's so spooky. It's okay, you don't have to see it. I appreciate that. But now on to number two, a Chris Farley Polaroid. At Zach Bagans Haunted Museum, he has this celebrity deaths room, which first of all, I think it's really weird for people to fixate on the death of someone they don't know, and I think this item I'm gonna talk about is disrespectful. In the celebrity death room, there is a Polaroid of Chris Farley after his overdose that killed him. It was acquired from a police officer that was at the scene. Since I cannot and will not show that photo, just know that it was a photo of his dead body after a drug overdose that visitors have described as sickening, disgusting, shocking, and horrifying. Now, using the image of a dead person a real person as a gimmick is in poor taste and shows a lack of empathy on Begin's behalf and that scares me. So that's included on this list. On to number one, Peggy the doll in Peggy's room. Now this one has a past. Let's talk about this doll before it got to the museum. Peggy was sent to a British paranormal investigator named Jane Harris after Peggy's previous owner was having some nightmares where the doll would haunt her dreams. That owner would wake up hot and shaken with fevers and hallucinations and even her local priest couldn't help her out. She eventually figured it was because of Peggy the doll and sent her off to Harris. Once Jane Harris and her team had the doll, they tried to figure out what was up, and they say that Peggy is possessed by the spirit of a woman from London, born in 1946 and died of some sort of chest condition, which is very specific. Wow. Yes, that's the history, but how does Peggy haunt? Well, apparently through dreams, pushing people away from entering her room in the haunted museum, or even light bulbs going out when people mention Peggy's name. Now, people are warned not to look her in the eye because they could feel chest pains, nausea to the point of vomiting, or really bad headaches. And now this could be the spirit within the doll circumventing some of her own pain, or many coincidences lined up together. But either way, many say the scariest thing they saw on their trip to Zach Bagans Haunted Museum was Peggy. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have Ed Gein's Cauldron. Ed Gein's Cauldron is a cast iron pot that was found on the property of the infamous serial killer, Ed Gein. Gein was known for his gruesome crimes in the 1950s, and when police searched his property, they discovered not only the remains of his victims, but also various macabre artifacts made from human bones and skin. Among these items was the cauldron, which Gein allegedly used to hold body parts during his gruesome acts. After Gein's arrest, the cauldron was kept as evidence for several years before being returned to his family. However, it is said that the cauldron is cursed and has brought misfortune to anyone who has possessed it. According to legend, a man who bought the cauldron in the 1960s met a very quick and horrible demise shortly afterward. And another owner reportedly suffered from a series of tragic accidents. Today, the cauldron's whereabouts are unknown, and it remains a mysterious and haunting artifact associated with one of America's most notorious criminals. In our number nine spot today, we have John. John Merle's thumb. John Merle's thumb is a small, shriveled digit that is believed to have belonged to John Merle, a notorious American criminal who lived during the 19th century. The digit is said to possess a powerful curse and is associated with various tales of hauntings and misfortune. One of the most popular legends surrounding the thumb is that it is cursed to bring bad luck to anyone who possesses it. According to the legend, the thumb was cut off from Merle's body after his execution and passed down through a series of owners who all experienced misfortune and tragedy. It is said that the thumb would cause accidents, sickness, and even death to those who kept it in their possession. Another tale tells of a man who came into possession of the thumb and began experiencing strange occurrences, such as objects moving on their own and eerie whispers in the night. The man eventually became so terrified that he buried the thumb in a field, but it is said that the haunting continued even afterwards. Despite its ominous reputation, John Merle's thumb has been sought after by collectors and paranormal enthusiasts over the years. Some even believe that the thumb possesses a sort of supernatural power that can be harnessed for personal gain. However, most people are content to leave the thumb where it belongs and avoid any potential consequences of disturbing its resting place. In our number eight spot today, we have Old Neck. Old Neck, also known as the Swan Sea Devil, is a legendary figure that dates back to the 1890s and currently resides in the Swan Sea Museum. During that time, the prestigious St. Mary's Church, located in the town town's center was undergoing renovations, and when a local builder was turned down for the job, he sought revenge. He purchased a row of cottages adjacent to the church, demolished them, and built large brick offices, topping them with a carving of Old Nick. According to legend, he placed a curse on the church himself, declaring that this devil
devil would remain laughing after its destruction. Years later, during World War II, the town was heavily bombed and St. Mary's, along with most of the town, was destroyed. However, the office building with Old Nick remained undamaged. After the war, Old Nick disappeared, but later resurfaced, prompting a petition to return him to his former spot and also a counter petition to keep him far away from the rebuilt church. Currently, Old Nick resides behind glass in the Swansea Museum, and it is said that the glass enclosure is for the protection of visitors. In our number seven spot today, we have Charles Manson's TV. There are many haunting tales surrounding this TV, and honestly, that makes a lot of sense considering its history, as it was the one that was present in the Spawn Ranch where Manson and his followers resided for a period of time. This ranch was a former movie ranch that had fallen into disrepair and was used as a hideout by the Manson family. It was during their time at the ranch that they planned and carried out their atrocious crimes. The TV was present in the living quarters at the ranch and was said to have played a significant role in Manson's ability to manipulate and control his followers. Manson would often use the TV as a tool to brainwash and indoctrinate his followers with apocalyptic visions and very harmful ideologies. The TV was seized as evidence by the police following the arrest of the Manson family members and has since been sold at auction. The exact whereabouts of the TV at this point in time are unknown, but many have said that the TV is cursed by the evil energy that Manson himself held. In our number six spot today, we have the Atlantis Ring. The Atlantis Ring is a clay ring discovered in 1860 in an Egyptian high priest's tomb in the Valley of Kings. Howard Carter acquired the ring and kept it until his death in 1939. The ring is believed to be over 5,000 years old and is decorated with very unique geometric symbols not seen before in Egyptian culture. What makes this story so intriguing is that Carter, who discovered King Tut's tomb, claimed to have worn the ring as a talisman during the tomb's opening, which protected him from the curse. Unlike other members of his team, he did not die a mysterious death afterward. Instead, he attributed his protection to the ring's power. So I guess the ring is kind of like an anti-cursed object due to its association with the protection of Howard Carter. Although replicas are available, none are believed to possess the power of the original Atlantis ring. In our number five spot today, we have Bella Lugosi's mirror. Bella Lugosi, the actor who famously portrayed Dracula on screen, owned a mirror that is said to be cursed. According to legend, the mirror was given to Lugosi by a fan who claimed that it was possessed by the spirit of a dead woman. Lugosi allegedly experienced strange occurrences after acquiring the mirror, including seeing the reflection of the woman's face in the glass. He tried to get rid of the mirror, but it reportedly kept returning to him. After his death, the mirror passed through the hands of several owners who also reported strange phenomena associated with it, such as cold spots and apparitions. Some even claimed to have seen Lugosi's face staring back at them from the mirror. Today, the whereabouts of the mirror are unknown, and it remains one of the most mysterious and haunted objects in Hollywood history. In our number four spot today, we have Uluru Rock. Uluru Rock is a massive sandstone formation located in the southern part of the Northern Territory in Australia. It is a sacred site for the indigenous people of the area, and it is known as Ayers Rock. Visitors are advised not to take anything from the site, as it is considered disrespectful and can bring bad karma. However, some people still choose to smuggle pieces of rock out of the area. This act has reportedly resulted in severe consequences, including bad luck, illness, and even the death of loved ones. The curse associated with these stolen rocks is so strong that it is common for the company that manages the tours of the formation to receive letters of apology with the returned rocks. This phenomenon happens so often that the company expects to receive at least one letter a day. While some may dismiss this as a mere coincidence, the frequency and consistency of these occurrences suggest otherwise. In our number three spot today, we have Natalie Wood's yacht. The haunting tales surrounding Natalie Wood's yacht, named The Splendor, have been the subject of speculation and controversy for decades. In November 1981, the actress was on a weekend trip aboard the yacht with her husband, Robert Wagner, and friend, Christopher Walken. The circumstances surrounding her death have remained a mystery, but it is known that Wood drowned in the water near the yacht and her body was found the next morning. The yacht itself has been the subject of strange occurrences and haunting tales ever since. According to reports, strange noises 
noises and unexplained occurrences have been observed on board the yacht. Witnesses have reported hearing unexplained voices and footsteps, as well as doors opening and closing on their own. Some have even claimed to have seen the ghostly apparition of Natalie Wood herself still wearing the same clothing she had on the night of her death. Despite the rumors and tales, there is no concrete evidence to support the idea that the yacht that the yacht is actually haunted. However, the tragic circumstances surrounding Natalie Wood's death and the mysterious events that have been reported on the yacht have contributed to its reputation as a haunted vessel. In our number two spot today, we have the Screaming Skull. The Screaming Skull is housed in Burton Agnes Hall in England and is believed to have belonged to Catherine Ann Griffith. Catherine was the youngest in her family and enjoyed wandering the property, but on one such walk, she was attacked and robbed by a group of individuals who left her severely injured. Despite being brought back to the hall, Catherine passed away a few days later. Before her death, she requested that her family remove her head and keep her skull so that they would always have a piece of her with them. Following her burial, the family experienced strange occurrences in the house, including bumps, moans, and screams. It was then said that they decided to fulfill Catherine's request and the strange happenings stopped. However, when a maid found the skull and threw it out of a nearby window, which is a strange thing to do when you find a skull, the strange occurrences began again. Eventually, the family decided to place the skull in a secret spot within the walls of the house so that Anne's spirit could rest in peace. The story serves as a reminder to honor the wishes of those who have passed to avoid any lingering spiritual activity. In our number one spot today, we have the Dark Mirror, finishing this list off with another cursed mirror. This one is now a part of the Traveling Museum of the Paranormal and Occult, and that in itself is enough to understand why it is considered to be a cursed object. The museum acquired the mirror from its previous owner who had bought it from a psychic fair. Despite being created sometime around the 1820s or 1830s, the mirror still boasts a beautiful appearance, but it is believed to hold some dark secrets. The former owner reported that every time they looked into the mirror, they saw disturbing images that left them feeling very unsettled. Since joining the museum's collection, guests have also reported similar experiences, seeing reflections of their own dead bodies and other unsettling apparitions. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the RMS Republic. In 1981, researchers were on a dive when they came across the wreck of the RMS Republic. This ship was built in 1903 and it ended up being lost at sea in 1909. Since 1909, there were plenty of rumors that began swirling that said the ship may have been carrying a whole bunch of treasure. Like treasure that could perhaps be worth billions of dollars. One of the rumors was that the ship was carrying US gold coins that would have been worth a minimum of $250,000, but there's an even crazier rumor that the ship was carrying $3 million in coins as it was supposed to be a loan to Russia. Either way, this treasure has actually never been found as it certainly wasn't with the ship when the researchers came across it. Do you guys think that there was never any treasure or do you think that someone else found it first? In our number nine spot today, we have this ancient battle gear. Before I dive into this one, guys, please don't forget to hit the thumbs up button if you're enjoying the video so far because it really helps us out. These artifacts were actually found recently after a dive in 2013. Just off the coast of Sicily, archeologists located what they believe may have been the site of the first naval battle. They found armor, weapons, helmets, and battering rams, and they were even able to date them back to around 2,000 years ago, which is so unbelievable. They believe that these artifacts are the remains of the Battle of the Agati Islands. This was when the Romans battled against the Carthaginians for over 20 years. It is believed that around 50 ships were sunk in this time, and that is how these remains ended up there for two millenniums. I don't know about you guys, but it's honestly crazy to think about that stuff still being around. In our number eight spot today, we have Dwarka. There was a time when the city of Dwarka was considered to be just a myth, so it came as quite a shock when researchers found the lost city 120 feet under the water. Testing done on the city remains has dated them back to 9,500 years ago, which could possibly place it even before the start of Egyptian and Chinese civilizations. This lost city consisted of six sectors that were each divided into residential and commercial areas. Apparently the great flood that happened 9,000 years ago is the cause for the city to end up submerged in the ocean. It's crazy that we can look back 9,000 years ago and know things like that. 
The name Dwarka translates from Sanskrit to mean gateway to heaven. With the city, researchers also found construction material, pottery, beads, sculptures, and even human bones and teeth. The city had many, many royal palaces that were all made with crystal and silver and had emeralds as decorations. In our number seven spot today, we have ancient medicine. Just off the coast of Tuscany, in 2013, researchers found the Relito del Pizzino, which was a shipping vessel that they were able to date back 2,000 years ago. Among the remains of the ship, they found some items that would help give them insights into what life was like for ancient Romans, and one of the most interesting items was ancient medicinal pills. Researchers believe that these pills were used as an eye medication. They contained zinc compounds, starch, iron oxide, beeswax, and some plant-based materials. This really helped give us more insights into what was considered medicine all the way back then, but I feel like there are many things we still don't know for sure. In our number six spot today, we have the Antikythera Mechanism. I spoke about this crazy artifact in another one of my videos. In the very early 1900s, researchers found an ancient computer just off of a Greek island. This mechanism remains on display at the National Archaeological Museum of Athens because it is honestly unbelievable. This analog computer may have had a ton of uses and researchers aren't 100% sure about all the ways it was used, but it is known to have been some sort of astronomical calculator. It was able to predict eclipses and different planetary placements. It was found 45 meters below the water in the wreck of a ship. This mechanism has been dated back to somewhere around 87 BC, and it is thought to have been created by a Greek scientist, but unfortunately after the creation of this ancient computer, the knowledge of this kind of technology was lost before it was found again. I truly wonder where we would be technologically if we had never lost that kind of information. In our number five spot today, we have Gondwana. This one is hard to think of as an artifact, but I most definitely think it applies for today's list. In 2011, National Geographic published an article where they said that pieces of Gondwana may have been discovered deep in the Indian Ocean. Gondwana is the ancient continent that used to exist when Australia, India, and Antarctica were all one landmass. Apparently, they found the presence of granite and sandstone, which is unusual to find on the seabed and is much more common to continents. There isn't a ton that is known about these microcontinents, but it truly is very mysterious and very fascinating. Since these pieces were from a time when dinosaurs still roamed the earth, they have even found fossils. In our number four spot today, we have these Stone Age artifacts. Swedish divers found artifacts that they believe may have been the remnants of Swedish people all the way back from the Stone Age. These artifacts were found in the Baltic Sea and are believed to be 11,000 years old. They were found 16 meters below the water and their findings consisted of animal horns, flint tools, wood, and ropes. It's crazy that researchers have the ability to date these kinds of things as far back as they have with these ones. Apparently, they were also pretty well preserved when found, which is a whole other mystery to me. It may seem like a small find, but every artifact can help give us insight to what life on Earth was like all those years ago. In our number three spot today, we have the Bronze Age sewn boat. 2014 saw quite an interesting archaeological discovery when the researcher Gilia Boeto revealed that they had discovered a Bronze Age sewn boat. This boat was found in a cove in Croatia and has been dated to have been wrecked in 1000 200 BC, which is unbelievable. The boat is made out of wood that is sewn together by ropes, roots, and willow branches. It is seven meters long and two and a half meters high, and considering the fact that it is 3,200 years old, it certainly has held up remarkably. This boat has given us at least a small glimpse into how boats were made all the way back then. Sometimes I hear about things that really leave me in awe of the things that have gone on on our Earth. It's so unbelievably cool to think about. In our number two spot today, we have the Yonaguni Monument. Who would have thought that hammerhead sharks could lead to the discovery of an ancient artifact? Well, not exactly, but in the sea just off of Yunagani in Japan, there is a diving location that has a high population of hammerhead sharks, making it a large and popular attraction. In 1986, a diver in the area noticed some formation on the seabed that resembled a structure of some sort. This led to a team of scientists going on a dive to gather more information, and this is when the Yonaguni Monument was officially discovered. The monument is made out of sandstone and mudstone, but here's the mysterious thing. 
Scientists can't agree on its origins. There are some who believe that this is a natural formation, but there are some who swear that it is man-made. There are pretty reasonable arguments for both sides, and considering the fact that this thing is at least 10,000 years old, I guess it's fair to say that we may not have all the answers. In our number one spot today, we have Stardust. You guys, I truly don't even know what to make of this one. So apparently, 2.7 million years ago, a star exploded, and German researchers have now been able to locate pieces of it while they were drilling in the Pacific Ocean. I can't even believe that is a sentence that is true. This star was a type 2 supernova, which means that the star had to have at least 8 times the mass of the sun, and it also ejects iron 60 during the explosion. Somehow the star fragments ended up in the Pacific Ocean to be discovered in the remains of magnetic bacteria that were feasting on the iron from the star. Scientists believe it happened all that time ago because apparently iron 60 is way too young for Earth, whatever that means. Science is so crazy sometimes, you guys. Number 10, Pompeii Graffiti. What do Romans and Zoomers have in common? Probably their love for weird and semi-unfunny memes. Yes, even thousands of years in the past, people were leaving all sorts of tasteful messages on the walls for all to see. Insults, compliments, but more interestingly, threats. Most of these are obviously jovial in nature, but there is one that does stand out as interesting. The message reads, to the one defecating here, beware of the curse. If you look down on this curse, may you have an angry Jupiter for an enemy. Seems silly enough, right? Well, it is, until you learn that it was found at Pompeii, the city buried by a volcano. Sounds like a fairly wrathful act, eh? Seems like Jupiter was being a bit of a party pooper. Number 9. Hans Holbein's The Ambassadors Hans Holbein is a classic artist, but one of his most famous works stands out as a grim omen. In 1533, Holbein would be commissioned to portray ambassadors Jean de Dinfy of France and Georges de Save of Lavour. This work is an excellent piece, but it includes an enigmatic secret, a strangely proportioned skull. There are numbers of theories as to why this was included, one of the most popular coming from Oscar Bachmann and Pascal Grenier, who suggest that the skull is meant to contrast the beauty and value found within life against the grandeur of death. Holbein would pass almost exactly one decade later, which arguably completes the implication of this message in its entirety. Number 8. The Voyager Messages The Voyager Deep Space Program helped NASA further its understanding of the solar system with absolutely breathtaking images of the universe that were sent back to Earth. However, those messages weren't the only thing that the Voyagers were meant to carry. Inside each probe is a golden phonograph disc titled The Sounds of Earth, which includes several greetings, sounds of whales, a crying baby, waves on a shoreline, music from a scatterplot of important musicians from around the world, and greetings in around 55 different languages. While this seems like a friendly handshake from one part of the universe to another, the question must be asked, what will find this disc? What will they think of us? And what will they do next? The Voyagers are still out there, and they are expected to no longer be able to transmit anything to us in roughly around 2036. Which probably means that if anything does find them, we won't be getting a warning until they're here. Number 7. The Mayan Calendar Portents of doom are common enough in history. However, 2012 was an interesting year for such fears, as the turn of a new millennium caused a number of people to become absolutely certain that the world would end. To justify their claims, they looked to the past, and one message seemed to leave people more certain than others. 
Now, let's be clear, the Mayans didn't actually make this calendar. That would have to be attributed to the early Mesoamericans, who termed the end of a period as, of the time as the Bakhtun. Bakhtun 13 was the end of a particularly large period, and when lined up with our calendar, it matched up alongside the date of December 2012. So, was the message true? It was fun at the time, but after the date passed, the real horror was revealed as people admitted to selling their possessions and homes with the expectation that they just wouldn't need them anymore. All because of a calendar period ending in a way that most computer technicians would just describe as stack overflow. Like, your car doesn't explode when you max out the mileage counter, it just resets to zero. So the terror here was more that people actually believed this crap, just because the Mesoamericans didn't make a Bakhtun 14. Jeez. Number 6. Qin Shi Hong's Meteor so in 211 BC, the Qin Dynasty was in full swing and everyone was having a great time, suffering under the rule of their tyrannical overlord Qin Shi Hong. Suddenly, a meteor fell from the sky, landing in the province of Dongzhen. Upon inspection, the meteor was revealed to have been inscribed with the words, The first emperor will die, and his land will be divided. Whether or not this was an elaborate hoax or not, the Emperor was paranoid enough to demand that the writer come forward, and when no one did, he had everyone who lived in the area executed. The funny thing is, a year later it came true. Qin Shi Hong died, and while China remained somewhat unified, the Qin Dynasty fell only three years later. And soon after that, the Han Dynasty took over, ending the Qin's dynasty's short reign. Unfortunately, the meteor was shattered, so this brilliant moment has been permanently lost to time. Number 5. Egyptian Tomb Curses Ah, Egypt! One of the greatest civilizations known to mankind. Thank goodness that a bunch of Europeans decided to rob the graves of their ancestors or else they'd have been really bored or something. Uh, however, when these losers decided to pop open those tombs, likely searching for gold, they instead found a cavalcade of curses. Some of these read as such. Any ruler who shall do evil or wickedness to this coffin, may his heir not inherit. As for all men who shall enter my tomb, there will be judgment. I shall cast the fear of myself into him. And all who enter this tomb will make evil against it. May the crocodile be against them in the water, and the snakes against them on land. May the hippopotamus be against them in water, and the scorpion on land. Aside from being incredibly cool and threatening, these grave robbers were also plagued with visions of ghosts, and many died, usually from disease-carrying insects and violent animals. Huh, who could have seen that coming? Number 4. The Ring of Senesenius this ring was discovered by a farmer plowing his land in 1785, but wouldn't be brought to archaeologists until years later. Made from 12 grams of gold, the ring contains an inscription in Latin which reads, Senesene vivus in Deum, which kind of translates to live in God, although the ring apparently has some spelling errors, so... Whatever, it doesn't matter. A tablet was discovered which was inscribed within a curse, claiming that whoever removed the ring would never again be in good health until it was returned to Nodens. The archaeologist who excavated the site decided to call upon a close friend to research the actual location of Nodens, a professor at Oxford named J.R.R. Tolkien. That's right, baby. This little curse inspired the Lord of the Rings. Number 3. The Serbian Skull Tower Signs are very effective means of ensuring through symbology that people can understand what they mean even without speaking the language of the people that they were made by. For instance, red is generally the color that is universally used to denote that everyone should stop. 
And skulls usually denote that everyone in the area should probably turn around and leave. There's no better example of this than the Skull Tower, located in Serbia. Apparently, in 1804, there was a Serbian uprising against the Ottomans, an uprising that failed in spectacular fashion. After their battle, the governor of the area decided that the easiest way to ensure no one tried it again was to create a tower out of the skulls of the rebels, sending a very clear message to anyone with seditious thoughts. Just try it. Number 2. The Czech Republic Warning Stones as the world is racked with an oncoming ecological disaster that you should be as terrified of as I am, artifacts have been uncovered which have revealed some fascinating messages. Prior to the invention of the internet, the residents of the area had the idea to inscribe messages on stones which would warn people of incoming disasters such as droughts, famines, bad harvests, food shortages, and just incoming hunger in general. This last part led to their being dubbed as the Czech Hunger Stones, with dates going back as far as 1417. Some quotes that can be found on these messages are deeply disturbing, such as, When you see me, weep. I guess the Morning Stones are doing their job pretty well this time around. Number 1. Charles Maffel's Final Message and Jeremiah Burke's Final Message Messages in bottles are some of those neat little things that are synonymous with the adventures of pirates and other seafaring individuals. These messages aren't exactly as whimsical. In 1909, the vessel Waratah set sail from South Africa to Australia, but went missing at sea. Numerous people attempted to claim that they'd received letters in bottles from drowned sailors, and while most were clearly fake, one did prove to be genuine, matching with the sailor's handwriting and the time with which he would have had to write it. The message reads, Top heavy. One side awash. Goodbye, mother and father. Signed, Charles McFell, Greaser. Several years later, a similar incident would occur with the sinking of the Titanic and the discovery of a letter sent from Jeremiah Burke, reading, From Titanic, Goodbye All, Burke of Glanmire, Cork. The message was written on a scrap of paper, then placed inside an empty bottle of holy water given to the man by his mother prior to the voyage. She died before she could read it. Coming in at number 10, we have the Ulfbert Swords. Imagine if Excalibur was real and it wasn't just a story after all. Here at number 10, we have swords that are so powerful, they still have experts baffled. When you think of medieval times, you probably picture a bunch of people carrying cool broadswords everywhere. But in reality, swords were actually incredibly expensive to have made, even around this time. Anywhere between 1200 to 24 grand in today's currency for one sword. And that's just for a pretty good sword. For a a really good sword. Well, get ready to sell your soul, man. The Ulfbert swords were the strongest, sharpest, and most flexible swords ever made, though no one really knows who made them, except maybe a guy named Ulfbert, but there's no record of him. Primarily associated with Vikings, researchers speculate that the swords were made in the Kingdom of Francia. The Kingdom of Francia, now France and Germany. These suckers could even cut through chain mail and were the perfect blend of materials. The process for combining the materials required a 1600 degree Celsius oven, which was not only hot enough to melt the metals, but also help draw out any impurities. However, here's where things get weird. The process couldn't be replicated until the industrial era after the sword stopped production after 200 years. So how could they have been made before that? No one knows who began it and who carried on the tradition, but the blade still remains some of the finest ever made in history. Coming in at number 9, we have Stonehenge. Located in Wiltshire, England, the Stonehenge is one of UK's most famous landmarks. It consists of a bunch of standing stones in a ring, with some stones placed on top of each other. It's said to have taken 50 
1,500 years to build this. It was built around 5,000 to 4,000 years ago. Some stones are 30 feet tall and weigh 25 tons. The smallest stones weigh about four tons. So how the heck did these people manage to build this big structure? That is something we still don't have the answers to. It's not like they had the machinery back then to help them. So how did they move these hefty rocks and then get them on top of each other? Did they possess superhuman strength or what? Not only that, but we don't know why they were built. Some believe that it was part of a burial ground. Others think that it was part of ritual activities, but we still don't know for sure. And unless a builder comes back from the dead to tell us, I doubt we'll ever figure out what the purpose behind Stonehenge is. Coming in at number eight, we have the Dropa Stones. I honestly love how many times I get to talk about potential alien stuff on this channel. In 1938, 716 12,000 year old circular disks were discovered in a cave between the border of China and Tibet. About one foot in diameter, the disks allegedly told the story of an alien ship crash landing and that the ship contained the Dropa people. Near the site, Dr. Chi Tai also found tiny skeleton bodies with larger than normal heads, like they were kind of like oval and shaped. Though no photos or documentation to prove that that part exists. The discs were stored in Beijing University for two decades before they were released to be studied, and one researcher was the one to decipher the extraterrestrial tale in just four years. However, after the stones were taken down after the exhibition, they haven't been seen since. Many say they are still at the university, while others speculate whether they existed at all. Some, however, were sent to Russia to be studied, where part of their studies included placing the discs on a turntable. The discs appeared to hum, but any further details on what they found still remain a mystery. In our seventh spot, we have the Petrodox. This next artifact is quite strange and might have been made by aliens. Let me explain. So back in 1998, a man named John J. Williams discovered something quite strange. He was out hiking in North America when he saw this thing sticking out of the ground. It looked as if it was an electrical connector. When he unearthed it, he discovered that this device was embedded into a rock. The rock has three metallic prongs just sticking out of it, and it wasn't glued or welded into the rock. Leading researchers believe that it existed while the rock was forming. But here's the thing, research shows that the rock is 100,000 years old. Back then, we didn't have electrical components like that, so what the heck? Now, Williams won't let anyone break into the object to further analyze it, but x-rays done on the stone show that it has a weird, opaque internal structure. He's convinced that this thing is from an advanced ancient civilization, or from an extraterrestrial race, aka aliens. Like, I'm not gonna lie but it's pretty weird, so just saying. Coming in at number six, we have the Baghdad Battery. Here is yet another example of how our ancestors absolutely soared past our expectations of them. We thought electricity was just a modern thing. A 2,000 year old battery discovered by Wilhelm Koenig in 1940. It was uncovered during a dig of an ancient village near Baghdad and set the minds of archeologists Spinning. It is a 5.5 inch high clay vessel with a copper cylinder inside and an oxidized iron rod suspended within the cylinder, not touching the sides, and the two entrances are closed off by asphalt plugs. It is suspected that this makeshift battery served as a way of electroplating gold onto silver, only needing to be filled with some kind of acid like wine or vinegar in order to work. Today, some researchers believe that it was actually just a storage container, but that's not true. Come on. But replicas created by American electrical researcher Willard Gray after World War II actually produced around two volts of electricity. I love discoveries like this because it tells us just how ahead of the game we were and gave a delicious dose of foreshadowing at where we are heading as a civilization. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the witch bottles. Back in 2019, contractors were demolishing the chimney of a pub and inn in England when they came across something frightening. Inside the chimney were bottles containing things such as fish hooks, human teeth, and urine. But this isn't actually that weird of a find. In the 15th, 16th, and 17th century, people kept these in their home. They were referred to as witch bottles and were meant to keep witches away. Some of the bottles had fingernails and hair in them, and those were meant to act like charms to ward them away. But they were most commonly filled with pins, thorns, and urine. Apparently, the urine attracted the witches to the bottle, and then they would be trapped on the pins. These bottles have been found in churchyards, old buildings, and riverbanks all across Great Britain. I mean, I think that would be a pretty cool discovery if you found that in your house, just minus the jar 
jars of urine. Coming in at number four, we have a 250,000 year old aluminum wedge. Aluminum, a material found in every kitchen for barbecue or you know, just like cooking in general. It's one of the most commonplace materials found on Earth, making up approximately 8.2% of the Earth's crust. However, we as humans only figured out how to extract it in the 1800s, taking even longer to figure out how to make it cost effective to do so. So when researchers found a five pound crafted aluminum object in Romania, buried next to 10,000 year old Macedon bones, they had some questions. The object has clearly been crafted by someone for some purpose and is a combination of several materials, aluminum making up 89% of that. The aluminum wedge has been theorized to have been everything from a tool to a landing foot of perhaps an extraterrestrial ship. This object also feeds into the theory that there was a far advanced human civilization that existed long before us that was wiped out. This isn't the first time we've talked about aliens and forgotten civilizations and honestly, the more videos we make, I'm getting swept away by the possibilities because how like nuts would that be? Anyways, whatever it was used for or whomever it used to belong to remains a mystery and leaves more questions than answers behind. In our third spot, we have the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone was discovered in 1799 and is a broken off section of a bigger stone slab. On it, it contains messages written in three different types of scripts ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics, demotic scripts, and ancient Greek. This stone is said to be the key to decipher Egyptian scripts. The stone was discovered by soldiers belonging to Napoleon Bonaparte's army. In July of 1799, they were digging around and found it near the town of Rashid, and it was built into an old wall. In 1814, British scientist Thomas Young started studying the stone and made some progress with cracking it. But it wasn't until 1822 to 1824 that the hieroglyphic code was cracked. This was done by French linguist Jean-Francois Champollion. It's hypothesized that the slab was created in Egypt in 196 BC, but we still don't know who created it and honestly, why? Some say it holds the key to be able to communicate with aliens and that it actually came from space. At this point, who knows? Then we just seem like we love aliens. aliens. Coming in at number two, we have the Nazca Lines. Despite years of research, the Nazca Lines still don't make sense. For those of you who haven't heard, the Nazca Lines are massive geoglyphs that can even be seen from space. In fact, they can only be seen fully from the sky. Located 250 miles south of Lima, Peru, created by the Nazca people, there are over 70 precise depictions of animals including spiders and hummingbirds, plus an image of a decapitation and a large humanoid figure known as the astronaut. Hmm. Guys, come on, aliens. Some of the designs from the geoglyphs measure around 30 miles, and experts have no idea how or why these drawings were created with such precision. After all, humans lack the tools to build such incredible designs. Or did they? It really makes you wonder what abilities or perhaps extraterrestrial intelligence was available to the Nazca people that we can't comprehend today. And in our number one spot, we have the Shroud of Turin, otherwise known as the Holy Shroud. This is a piece of linen that is said to have been wrapped around Jesus during his burial. What's fascinating is how this piece of linen cloth appears to have a facial outline of Jesus' face. Of course, over the years, there have been disputes to whether or not this is authentic. But in the 1970s, it was discovered that the markings on the cloth were consistent with a crucified body, and that the blood stains on it were from real human blood. But others argue that the shroud doesn't come from the right time period as Jesus. And in 2018, a team of researchers claimed that the blood stains couldn't have come from him. Either way, it acts kind of like a symbol for the story of Christ. If it's not real, then someone please explain to me the whole face and body print that I see on it, because I'm genuinely curious. Mm -hmm. 